People generally forget the mistakes of the past. Citizens who are caught up in Hitler's Nazi Germany hardly notice the gradual development of extremism, mainly due to high emotions and dazzling propaganda. But history often repeats itself. FEMA plastic coffins, detention centres, armoured checkpoints and armoured military vehicles for civil purposes are well-documented facts and witnesses who have worked for the United States military claim stores of guillotines located in Fort Lewis military facility. The latest revelation of Obamacare sanctions death by guillotine, code ICD-9E978. However, Obama was only following the mandate of the World Health Organization, one of the specialized agencies under the United Nations. Is the United States government getting ready for a fascist quasi-dictatorship involving forced religion, it would not be the first time that fascism and counterfeit Christianity have merged. Fascism and Catholicism have become synonymous throughout history. Recent developments have seen so-called Protestantism clasping hands with the Vatican. Protestantism once meant protesting against the Roman Catholic Church and her doctrine, labelling the Pope as the Antichrist as the reformers proclaimed during the Reformation. An ex-Jesuit priest, Dr. Alberto Rivera, explains. In America, the Vatican's agents were at work to wipe out the Protestant movement through ecumenism, a secret sign to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when this was accomplished by the Vatican was when a President of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk, a four-sided pillar that resembled the Washington Monument and the one in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. For the first time in history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument on January the 20th, 1981. For those who are unfamiliar with the Jesuit order, it was the Catholic answer to counteract the Reformation sparked in 1517. Viola Ignatius's formula for the formation of the Jesuits was approved by Pope Paul III in 1540. Napoleon Bonaparte had this to say about the Jesuit order. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is the general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign, over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work, if committed for the interest of the society of the Jesuits or by the order of the general. The Vatican has historically used civil powers in past ages as she does today. Kings, dictators, presidents and prime ministers bow and scrape to the most powerful and richest organization on the planet, because it is politically expedient to do so. The Roman Catholic Church is secretly tightening her grip on geopolitics and the autonomy of nations who are secretly serving the Pope. Pope John Paul II and President Reagan worked together bringing about the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the first blow being the breaking down of the Berlin Wall. After years of the Vatican being accused of being un-American, the United States and the Holy See announced the establishment of diplomatic relations on January the 10th, 1984, under the Reagan administration. The Senate confirmed William A. Wilson as the first US ambassador to the Holy See. The alliance between the United States and the Vatican benefited both political powers. The Cold War and Marxist atheism made the Vatican and the United States unlikely bed partners. As US presidents are well aware of the authority the Vatican wields, with just over 1.1 billion Catholics spread throughout the world, Jesuit educational facilities also spread and indoctrinate both Catholic and non-Catholic students with Jesuit maxims around the world shaping the minds of future leaders so the Vatican is truly a force to be reckoned with. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may be gathered by the remark of the New York Catholic Conference, namely that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Another statement, made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest, is perhaps even more telling. 
The Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T and US Steel combined. And our roster of Jews paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. Avro Manhattan. The Central Intelligence Agency was the creation of Roman Catholic Knight of Malta member Alan Dulles. In recent years, CIA NSA directors have been Catholic Jesuit educated men. Historically, the confessional was the biggest intelligence gathering machine of the Vatican. But now electronic surveillance has superseded the confessional as the single most effective tool of modern times, giving the edge on business, politics and religion. A Catholic has first duty to the Pope before loyalty to a king, queen or country. Perhaps this is why many misgivings are expressed about Roman Catholics holding positions that pertain to national security. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman Pontiff, Pope Boniface. The Roman Catholic Church has always been savvy influencing armies to do her bidding because wars cost money. Let's take a look at the leaders that the Vatican has used in the past to achieve her religio-political ends. King Clovis I who united the barbarian tribes that eventually became the Franks and then enforced the rule of the Roman Catholic Church during the decline of Rome after Emperor Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople. King Charlemagne enforced Catholicism and was then crowned Emperor by Pope Leo III at Christmas in 800 AD. King Charles IX ordered the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of the Huguenots, French Calvinist Protestants, beginning on the 23rd of August 1572 in mostly Catholic Paris. King Philip II of Spain ordered the Spanish Armada to invade Protestant England in 1588. Dr. Alberto Rivera, an ex-Jesuit priest, also gives us information on the rise of Adolf Hitler. Another great inquisition was about to begin. Instead of wearing Dominican robes, they were wearing Nazi uniforms. Hitler's brown shirts, called the Nazis, back to the Vatican, used the same tactics of Mussolini beating and bullying opposition into submission, including Roman Catholics. Dr. Alberto Rivera. Hitler's book Mein Kampf was ghost-written by Jesuit priest Father Steinfeld. When it became known that Pope Pius XI supported Hitler, the Roman Catholic vote swept Hitler into power in 1933. Jesuit Father Himmler, an uncle of Heinrich Himmler, was a favourite of Jesuit Father General Count Hulk von Litokowski. The SS organisation had been constituted by Himmler. According to the principles of the Jesuit order, the regulations and spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuit General. The whole structure was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order. Walter Schellenberg Munich University was founded with papal approval in 1472 and was previously the University of Ingolstadt. Eventually becoming a stronghold of the Jesuit order, the university also became the centre of the Counter-Reformation. Jesuit Petrus Canisos was the rector of the university. Both Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, and Pope Benedict XVI were educated here. Interesting enough is that Pope Benedict XVI was a member of Hitler Youth. Joseph Mengel was an SS Nazi doctor, who also was educated at the Jesuit-controlled Munich University. Mengel identified himself as a Catholic and assigned himself to Nazi Germany's racial purity project which reached its climax at Auschwitz. He was called Uncle Mengel by the children whom he handed lollies to. Sadly, they were experimented on a short time later. The inmates who suffered at the hands of Mengel often died from shock and infection. In 1933, communications between the Nazis and the Vatican were welcomed by the Vatican's Secretary of State, Eugenio Cardinal Pacelli, a former papal diplomat to Berlin. During an elaborate ceremony on July the 20th, 1933, a concordant between the Holy See and the German Reich was officially signed and sealed by Vice-Chancellor Franz von Papen and Cardinal Pacelli. Hitler had a dream of a one-world government. Like many other Machiavellian men of past and present times, the Vatican will covertly support anyone 
whom they think will have a credible chance of unifying the world. Under one political umbrella so that the Vatican can force their apostate religion on others. The Guardian reported, as well as other sources, collaboration between the Nazis and the Vatican, helping war criminals escape the end of World War II. Dictator of Spain, General Franco, who championed the causes of Catholicism, fighting communism, using torture and execution to crush enemies or dissenters, while many are distracted by the false front of Zionism. The Roman Catholic Church has infiltrated and commandeered the United States without the public being aware. It is obvious that the US Constitution is eroding under the influence of the Jesuits. The crack troops of the Vatican. Breach of Amendment 6. NDAA Indefinite Detention Act without trial is an extension of the Patriot Act. Crafted by Jesuit Georgetown University educated Professor Yet Din. The assassination of foreign nationals, as well as US citizens abroad by predator drones, is also a breach of the Sixth Amendment. Chuck Hagel, Leon Panetta and Donald Rumsfeld have attended Jesuit universities and all have held the position of US Secretary of Defense. The mighty and widely ramified Order of St. Ignatius was powerful enough to procure by its interest far greater advantages to individuals than could any other corporation, fraternity or even secular power. Jesuit General Jean-Baptiste Janssens Breach of Amendment 4, spying on US citizens without warrant. Former NSA Director, General Michael Hayden, and incumbent NSA General Keith B. Alexander are both Roman Catholics and tools of the Jesuits. General Michael Hayden was also educated at a Jesuit university. Revelations from Edward Snowden reveal just how widespread this illegal surveillance extends itself. Many nations are holding conferences on how to counteract this problem. Public outrage has been expressed in places like Germany, but it seems that some German government departments, like BND, have implicit involvement with the NSA. Many governments portray disapproval publicly to the media, but secretly aid and abet US spy agencies. Breach of Amendment 2, the right to keep and bear arms. Michael Quigley, educated by the Jesuits, sponsored an amendment to the Patriot Act prohibiting the sales of weapons to people on the FBI terrorist watch list. The trouble is that the FBI now regards some protesters and independent journalists as a threat to national security, therefore deemed terrorists. The First Amendment is on the Roman Catholic Jesuit hit list and is of supreme importance to the Vatican. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law of the establishment of religion. When the Protestant movement broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, Protestants still honoured the Roman Catholic institution of Sunday. The Protestant reformers never completely severed the umbilical cord from the papacy. In this quote, the Roman Catholic Church makes sport of Protestants for contradicting their beliefs. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as a day for public worship. After the Catholic Church made the change, but the Protestant mind does not seem to realise that Observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman of the church, the Pope. Our Sunday visitor, February the 5th, 1950. By the annihilation of the First Amendment, the Vatican can sweep many other religions and beliefs into a web of deception and control, making Muslims, Buddhists, Protestants and any other religion bow down in honour to the Vatican, therefore Satan himself. Acknowledging her day of Sunday or Sun Worship Day, that was not kept by any of the disciples or any of the early churches comprising Gentile or Jew. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. The United States government has three branches, executive, legislative and judicial. The most powerful branch is judicial because they have the power to interpret the law. Even if a law or amendment is unconstitutional, they still reserve the right to make the final decision. 
only the majority of the Supreme Court judges are Roman Catholic, with the other two judges being Jewish. Laws can be written in a sort of ambiguous way, crafted by Jesuit-trained lawmakers, so that Supreme Court judges can interpret them any way that suits the papal agenda. There are hidden laying dormant in many of the states of America insidious blueprints for the enforcement of Sunday law and a gross breach of the First Amendment. Blue laws are used, which refers to laws enacted by the Puritan colonies in the 17th century to prevent recreational or commercial activities on Sunday. And during the 19th century in America, some southern and midwestern states passed laws to protect Sunday as a day of worship both on a state and local level. Penalties for non-religious activities on Sunday targeted Seventh-day Adventists, Jews and other non-religious people for not attending church, playing cards, baseball and menial chores. In 1889, A.T. Jones, a Seventh-day Adventist, spoke before a United States Congressional Subcommittee, the topic of the discussion being the Breckenridge Bill, which proposed the compulsion of Sunday observance in Washington, D.C. Jones's testimony helped to defeat this bill, and he became known for his abilities in defense of the bill and knowledge regarding freedom of religion. We can see the Jesuits working covertly through the European Sunday Alliance organization to enforce Sunday as a day of rest in the guise of a secular family day. Before 9-11, it was hard to imagine that a government could enforce such laws as warrantless wiretaps on citizens, detention without charge or trial, or assassination of citizens deemed a threat to national security. Is it that hard to imagine a government now enforcing religious observance by fine, imprisonment and eventually the death penalty? While you're thinking about that question, there are drones circling the skies ready to obliterate anyone the CIA, NSA or Department of Defense give authorization to kill. There are facilities in the United States that qualify as a quasi-neo-fascist system of dealing with civil unrest by potentially enforcement of tyrannical laws. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, sounds eerily similar to the Committee of Public Safety, which beheaded many during the French Revolution. Recent DHS advisors and secretaries like John Brennan and Janet Napolitano are Jesuit trained. Jesuit education was described by Jesuit General Pedro Urupe in these terms. Jesuit education would consist in the creation of multiplying agents. Lisa Monaco, former prosecutor, was an advisor to FBI Director Robert Mueller and advised the DHS on counter-terrorism during the false flag operation of the Boston bombing. Little do people know that Barack Obama was groomed by the Jesuits and worked in a Christian grassroots organization called the Gamil Foundation under the direction of Jesuit priest Gregory Galuzzo who became his mentor. And does he keep in, in contact with the organization now? You know, uh, once he became a U.S. senator, he he's very much in demand. So it's only on occasion we get to interact with him. Well, an, an occasion is fine, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> once in office, Obama appointed many Jesuit-trained people to key positions of U.S. government. In fact, no other U.S. president in history appointed as many Jesuit educated individuals as Obama. Recently, the president recommended apologist for assassination of Americans, Jay Johnson, as new Secretary of Homeland Security, seen here at Jesuit Fordham University. Jay Johnson was appointed General Counsel at the Department of Defense and is considered one of the legal architects of the US military's current counter-terrorism policies. Jay Johnson is an American civil and trial lawyer so his legal experience allows him to make the US Constitution a very grey area which only lawyers have the talent to do. Chair Johnson has made quotes such as belligerents who also happen to be US citizens do not enjoy immunity where non-citizen belligerents are valid military objectives. So as Chair Johnson takes the position of Secretary of Homeland Security one must ask exactly what does the DHS have planned for the future, considering his relevant experience. An alarming fact is that the French Revolution's committee of public safety protagonists, Louis Antoine de Saint-Just and Maximilien Robespierre were Jesuit educated. This period had been labeled the reign of terror. 
That being said, let us now turn our attention to the portion of Scripture that tells of beheadings in the last days for not adhering to the man-made Sunday laws. Revelation 24 And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The testimony of military personnel that guillotines are being stored at US military bases raises concerns and interest. Maybe this information could tie in with Revelation 24 on the subject of beheading. Apparently this way of execution is one of the most painless and can be administered with ruthless efficiency on a mass scale, sending stern warnings to dissenters publicly. The Bible describes the Sunday law as the mark of the beast. By the Vatican's own omission in the following statement, they admit Sunday has nothing to do with the word of God and is their own invention. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of the fact. Catholic record. The first observance of Sunday keeping by Christians that history records is in the 4th century when Constantine issued an edict not requiring its religious observance, but simply abstinence from work, reading, Let all the judges and people of the town rest, and all various trades be suspended on the venerable day of the sun. Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea claims that Constantine and his army were marching toward Rome when Constantine looked up at the sun and saw a cross, with the Greek words, In this sign you will conquer. At the time of the issue of this edict, Constantine was a supposed newly converted Christian, but also a sun worshipper. In a shrewd political move to unite Rome, Constantine amalgamated pagan sun worship and Christianity, transferring the Sabbath, Saturday, to Sun Worship Day, Sunday. The organisation of this system of worship became what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. Sun worship can easily be seen here in the monstrance, which carries the consecrated host for adoration. The communion wafer which represents the body of Christ is a sun disc shaped wafer. So the Catholic priest, by supposed sorcery, turns the wafer into the body of Christ. The created creating the creator? The Roman Catholic Church has a long history of quackery, following the superstitious even to this day. At every turn you will see within the Vatican or Catholic Church's sunbursts. Neither Christ nor the disciples or the early churches ever mention Sunday as Holy Day. Yet many claim that because Christ rose on Sunday, that this day must be the new Sabbath. But history refutes this argument for the reason that Christian churches kept the Sabbath up until Constantine's edict in 321 AD. And yet some may claim that the Sabbath is exclusively for the Jews, but the Bible puts this claim to rest. Genesis 2-3 And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. This is clearly evidence that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath. Many today are still confused which is the seventh day of the week. The majority of society are unaware that the Sabbath, Saturday, is the seventh day. The Jews came into existence much later in history. Another fact is that the early churches such as in Corinth, Galatia, Thessalonica, Ephesia, Colossae, all kept the biblical Sabbath and were comprised of both Jew and Gentile. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ should not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And furthermore, the apostle warns his brethren, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3, 4 and 7 Even at that early date he saw creeping into the church errors that would prepare the way for the development of the papacy. The United States of America was a Protestant country as the people who fled Europe were fleeing despotic institutions like the papacy. Historians claim this haughty power killed more than 80 million people for such crimes as owning a Bible or whatever the prelate deemed as heresy. 
The CIA World Factbook states that only 23.9% of Americans are Catholic. But the US government is mostly either Catholic, Catholic controlled or Catholic educated. So the interest of the Vatican will be paramount in the near future when Sunday observance shall be enforced by law and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath. I would like to introduce this call for discernment um, as one that is the most crucial call for all of Christianity worldwide. And I would like to do so by stating very briefly that before I was saved by the Lord, I was hopelessly lost in conspiracy theories. I was learning lots of truth, lots of things that are actually true. There are certain um, secret societies and things. There is something called the Illuminati. Uh, these things do exist. However, it's important to know the origins of them. For instance, lots of people do not know that Adam Weissat was a Jesuit. People do not know things like that. Uh, they're not interested. Men like Alex Jones will not discuss the Jesuits. Um, and unfortunately at the time, uh, I was not a Christian. I had no interest in Jesus Christ. And a great deal of what I was learning was just being spoon-fed me by lying New Age snake oil salesmen. Coming out of all kinds of bogus arguments about the Bible and just lots of other nonsense. I can now see, however, that I was living in a, a foolish arrogance by presuming that I would be free from all of all of the um, the lies once the Lord saved me. Um, indeed, um, there's more deception, I feel, within Christianity than outside. And the reason being is Jesus Christ is the truth. And Satan is the father of lies. He has never stopped trying to kick up clouds of dirt to obscure the truth. And Christianity is far from exempt. Indeed, it appears that Satan's hardest work has gone into confusing Christianity. A sort of mimic of how God confused Satan's children at the Tower of Babel. Now, I'm making this video because the Lord has shown me but the majority of Christians believe in two specific sets of doctrine which have been created absolutely by the children of the devil and are thus inspired by the spirit of our enemy. Now, for most Christians, the things I'm about to state and conclude upon will come as a surprise, but I would ask you to not simply dismiss the facts I will present, nor simply to believe everything I have said but rather pray to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would reveal the truth of these matters to you and guide you in all truth by the power of his Holy Spirit. I make no apology for presenting this information quite informally and unprofessionally. I want for you to examine the facts for yourselves. The Lord has shown me that as his children, we can only ever be truly convinced of something if our Father has told us it is true. May God guide you in all truth. The Reformation is a title typically given to the movement that saw the providence of God sweep across Europe with men independently seeking to translate the Bible into native tongues. Ultimately the people were enlightened by this and broke free of the yoke of papal authority, persecution and blinding false doctrine. Before this were the, the Dark Ages which as one would expect by its name, was a time in which Rome kept the masses blind, with only certain priests being allowed to read the scriptures. No questioning of papal authority was allowed, and of course before, as well as after the Reformation, if anyone were to be found translating the Bible, or reading it illegally, they were to be executed by the papacy. So the Reformation is absolutely crucial for all of Christianity. We have so much to be grateful for. Indeed, we should be praising God that we even have his word and that we can read it in peace. And yet so many people leave it on their shelves to collect dust. 
but it's the the main debate of the Reformation. It's the main um, contradiction between the two parties that I want to examine here as we begin. In the Bondage of the Will, which was written by Martin Luther, he replied to the Roman Catholic scholar Erasmus, and Erasmus's diatribe, the freedom of the will. Though disagreeing with everything else Erasmus wrote, Luther at least commended Erasmus for recognizing that the, the crux of the matter at issue between Rome and the Bible believers was the debate over free will. In this regard, Luther wrote, but unlike all the rest, you alone have attacked the real issue, the essence of the matter in dispute, i.e. man's so-called free will and his salvation. You and you alone saw what was that grand hinge upon which the whole turned, and therefore you attacked the vital part at once, for which from my heart I thank you. And I thank him too, as it makes my job in this video that much easier, and it allows us to see Satan's scheming, so that we are not ignorant of his devices. And from this, we can see that the major factor of debate for the Reformation, as identified by Luther, was God's sovereignty, or man's free will in his salvation. Something resolved so brilliantly by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, with verses such as, 15 and 16, which say, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. The papists were on the side of the free will of man in his salvation, and the Protestants were on the side of God electing us to salvation as we are told in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, with verses like 4 to 6. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The doctrines of free will, and the most common form of eschatology, held by the overwhelming majority of supposedly Pro uh, Protestant denominations, were in fact given to the churches by the Vatican, through their militant arm, the Jesuits. I will now elaborate on this matter, but before we continue it is necessary to identify who the Jesuits are, and their purpose. The Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, or Los Alumbrados, as it was originally known, which being interpreted is the Illuminati, was created by Ignatius Loyola in September of 1540. Loyola was the author of Spiritual Exercises, and he experienced mystic visions beginning in 1523. In the visions, it was revealed to Loyola that he was to be the originator and the master of a grand army that would do battle with what he considered Babylonian hordes. We can see that the Jesuits are a corrupt tree, which of course bears corrupt fruit, by the oath that they are to swear for initiation. And as such, anything to do with them is to be avoided at all costs. I was going to read some excerpts of the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction, as recorded in the journals of the 62nd Congress, the United States Congressional Record. Um, however, it's, it's just far too blasphemous. Um, of course, it venerates Mary. Of course, it venerates the, the Pope, calling him holy and putting him in the place of God, of course. And it caused the superior general of the the Jesuits, it calls him the, the ghostly father, which I find both blasphemous and just a bit weird, really. Um, of course, it talks about uh, seeking to use subtlety and subterfuge uh, to undermine governments of the world um, and to 
depose kings and and leaders of countries. Of course, it very specifically attacks uh, Martin Luther, um, what it calls the, the Huguenots uh, and Calvinists and other Protestant groups at the time. And it basically says that they are to kill um, all Protestants if need be. And it says something about doing something horrible to their infants if need be. I find the whole thing absolutely disgusting and I've decided actually that I will not read it out. I have, however, left a link for you to read it yourself if you so wish. The thing that strikes me, of course, is that the loving Lord Jesus Christ, who told us to love our enemies and not to hinder the little children from coming to him, would not have had such filth spew from his stainless lips as doing to children what is described in this oath. Um, it's not quite being as harmless as doves now, is it? Um, let alone the fact that the Lord told us not to swear oaths at all. Um, I, I feel it quite correctly identifies Jesuitism as a corrupt tree, and therefore anything that comes from Jesuitism is a corrupt fruit. And as believers, we have a duty to be aware and to leave it and have nothing to do with it. Uh, the scripture comes to mind when I read this oath, uh, Matthew 7.15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The intent of the Jesuits, and certainly the intent of Loyola, who believed he, he had received this call from Mary, the mother of Jesus, was to enact a counter-reformation, as it is called, to undo the work of the reformers. Being a man who despised the doctrines of grace, Loyola saw the Protestants as the Babylonian hordes, which he should exterminate from the face of the whole earth, as the oath declares. We certainly can know them by their fruits. We should not be surprised that the Jesuits fully recognize the significance of the great debate of God's sovereignty over man's free uh, sorry God's sovereignty or man's free will in salvation. This debate was the the crux of the revolution uh, the reformation sorry as Luther rightly identified it. Indeed the Jesuits were even playing a part in this battle for biblical truth as I shall now show. 1545 the Council of Trent was convened by Pope Paul III. In this council, the Catholic Church adopted a stance on justification that was blatantly contrary to the Scriptures. In Canon 9 of the Council, the Church declared, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the uh, obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema, or accursed, that could be, I suppose. During the same council, the Jesuits were ordered by the Pope to make war silently and openly against the Reformation. And that's exactly what we see them doing. They were opposed to the doctrines of grace that God saves men whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world and said that it is man's free will and that man must cooperate in some manner. I know that Arminians would strongly disagree that this is what they believe. However, when we look at history and when we look at the facts, we can see that uh, it tells a completely different story. When the papers of Archbishop Lord, a self-confessed Jesuit, were examined, this letter was found among them, dated March 1628, a Jesuit's letter sent to the rector at Brussels about the ensuing Parliament. Now the design of this letter was to give the superior of the Jesuits, then resident at Brussels, an account of the posture of civil and ecclesiastical affairs in England. Here is an extract of that letter. Father Rector, let not the damp of astonishment seize upon your ardent and zealous soul. 
in apprehending the unexpected calling of a parliament. We have now strings to our bow. We have planted that sovereign drug, Arminianism, which we hope will purge the Protestants from their heresy. And it flourisheth and bears fruit in due season. For the better prevention of the Puritans, the Arminians have already locked up the Duke of Buckingham's ears. And we have those of our own religion which stand continually at the Duke's chamber to see who goes in and out. We cannot be too circumspect and careful in this regard. I am at this time transported with joy to see how happily all instruments and means, as well as lesser, cooperate unto our purposes. But to return unto the main fabric, our foundation is Arminianism. The Arminians and projectors, as it appears in the premises, affect mutation. This we second and enforce by probable arguments. That's taken by, uh, from Hidden Works of Darkness, page 89 and 19. For more about this, uh, please see the link uh, to an article entitled Arminianism, The Road to Rome. Uh, from this we can see quite clearly that the Jesuits believed that Arminianism was a drug that they had planted into Protestantism to undermine the uh, beliefs, which they call heresy, and that it will bear fruit in due season, and it's to undermine the Puritans, who held to, of course, the doctrines of grace. And, of course, uh, they even talk about undermining uh, the Duke of Buckingham, uh, so undermining the uh, the government, the, um, the, the constitutional system of, of England at the time. And this is f to affect mutation, so this is to, to, to alter Christianity uh, to their to their end. Now, if you're a Christian and you're watching this video and you've never even heard of Arminianism, it's likely that you are... Um, probably going to be an Arminian because, well, most Christians they actually are. So I'd invite you just to please uh, continue li listening uh, before you examine any of the links I'll post. Now the doctrines that Luther was defending uh, against the attack of the Papists, they are typically called Calvinism. Although like Charles Spurgeon, I don't really feel that this term is correct. Uh, these biblical concepts are often called the doctrines of grace. Now, to quote Spurgeon, um, the doctrines of original sin, election, effectual calling, final perseverance, and all those great truths which are called Calvinism, though Calvin was not the author of them, but simply an able writer and preacher upon the subject, are, I believe, the essential doctrines of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. However, the Counter-Reformation was a success, and the doctrines that the Jesuits sought to undermine have all but disappeared here in the UK, where I live. When the doctrines of grace are preached, they are typically promulgated by false teachers in the US, mixing God's sovereignty with other teachings given them and invented by the Jesuits. Um, I can think of just as an example uh, John MacArthur. John MacArthur is upheld as some uh, great hero of what is called Calvinism. However, the man, I mean, by any observation, appears to hold to futurism and dispensationalism. Don't worry if you're not familiar with those terms. I will expound upon what they mean and show you exactly where they come from now. Now I've said that you will know the Jesuits by their fruits, but what of the fruits of Arminianism, which Lord said Arminianism you know, said w that it would bear in, in due season? Before this is fully examined, we have to expose another doctrine held, again, by the vast majority of supposedly Protestant Christianity today. Now we'll look at um, futurism. I mentioned futurism. and I mentioned dispensationalism. Let's look at uh, the book of Revelation now. Let's look at eschatology, because this is very important 
in showing the the uh, means and ends of the Jesuits and just how powerful they have been in undermining Protestant Christianity. Now, like I said before, if you haven't heard of Arminianism, well, actually, it probably turns out that being a Christian today, you probably are an Arminian and you had no idea. Similarly, you may very well go to a church that teaches some kind of futurism. I'll just expand on what I mean by that. There are typically four different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. The preterist view says that the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled in the past. Now this view is often held to by Romanists, the Papists, and uh, this was developed by a Jesuit priest named Louis de Alcazar. The second is as follows. Now, uh, I'm just going to quote extensively from Wikipedia here, as any good scholar would. But before I do so, I should point out that at the time of the Reformation, uh, for a few hundred years after, and indeed to many pre-Reformation reformers, it was entirely apparent that the papacy was the Antichrist. I'm not going to present an argument in this video for that here, yeah, but um, for more information on that, on how the view became apparent and whether it is so, please see the links in the description box. I very strongly recommend it, that you do research this and examine this and pray about that. Now back to Wiki and the second way of interpreting Revelation. The view of futurism, a product of the Counter-Reformation, was advanced beginning in the 16th century in response to the identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Francisco Ribera, remember that name, a Jesuit priest, developed this theory in In Sacrum Beati Ionis Asp Apostoli and Evangelistiae Apocalypsin Commentari. His 1585 treatise on the Apocalypse of John and Saint Bellamine, remember that name as well, codified this view, giving in full the Catholic theory, theory sorry, set forth by the Greek and Latin fathers of a personal Antichrist to come just before the end of the world and to be accepted by the Jews and enthroned in the temple at Jerusalem, thus endeavouring to dispose of the exposition which saw Antichrist in the Pope. Most premillennial dispensationalists now accept Bellamine's interpretation in modified form. Widespread Protestant ident identification of the papacy as the Antichrist persisted in the USA until the early 1900s when the Schofield Reference Bible was published by Cyrus Schofield. This commentary promoted futurism, causing a decline in the Protestant identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Some U.S. futurists hold that sometime prior to the expected return of Jesus, there will be a period of great tribulation during which the Antichrist, indwelt and controlled by Satan, will attempt to win supporters with false peace and supernatural signs. He will silence all that defy him by refusing to receive his mark on their right hands or forehead. This mark will be required to legally partake in the end-time economic system. Some futurists believe that the Antichrist will be assassinated halfway through the tribulation, being revived and indwelt by Satan. The Antichrist will continue on for three and a half years following this deadly wound. In 1590, Ribera pu uh, published a commentary on the Revelation as a counter-interpretation to the prevailing view among Protestants, which identified the papacy with the Antichrist. Ribera applied all of Revelation, but the earliest chapters, to the end time rather than to the history of the church. Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and would rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, that quote in particular comes from George Eldon Ladd in The Blessed Hope, a biblical study of the Second Advent and Rapture. Now, um, another quote here is, Ribera denied the Protestant scriptural Antichrist, that comes from Second Thessalonians 2, as seated in the Church of God. 
he's set on an infidel antichrist outside the church of God. That quote is by Ralph Thompson. Uh, the result of his work, Ribera's work, was a twisting and maligning of prophetic truth, according to Robert Carino, uh, Carangola. So what I'm getting at with these quotes here is that basically 1,500 years of prophetic history was just swept under the proverbial rug. Uh, uh, and uh, how could that possibly happen? Well, you see, the Jesuits had added the infamous gap. They added something called the gap theory that teaches that when Rome fell in 70 AD, prophecy just stopped. And it would only continue again right around the time of the commonly held to secret rapture. Thus, the ten horns, the little horn, the beast, and the Antichrist have nothing to do with Christians today. According to this viewpoint, absolutely no prophecies were fil fulfilled during the Dark Ages, or during all these massively momentous occasions in man's history that have occurred, and will continue to occur, to occur until um, the dispensationalists and the arm. Um, the um, uh, well, well, the papists, for instance, agree that the rapture will then, uh, the tribulation will then start at seven years, at the end of time. You can probably tell that I don't agree with that view by now. Now, the other two views concerning the eschatology of um, uh, the Book of Revelation are the historicist view. Historicism is the belief that biblical prophecies about the little horn the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast, and the Babylonian harlot of Revelation 17 all apply to the developing history and tribulations of Christianity, culminating at the end of time. Historicism sees these prophecies as having a direct application to Papal Rome as a system whose doctrines are actually a denial of the New Testament message of free salvation by grace through simple faith in Jesus Christ apart from works. Historicism was the primary prophetic viewpoint of the Protestant reformers. And, uh, I mean, it, just looking at the Wikipedia article um, of it, there, there's hardly anything about it when you're looking at the, uh, the Wikipedia article for the Book of Revelation, which I find to be <laughs> quite uh, amusing. Um, there's lots about the, the other two. But when it comes to historicism, it says, well, no one really believes in this anymore. Maybe the Rastafarians or the Seventh-day Adventists or something like that. And the final view, the final way of interpreting the book of Revelation is called the uh, the spiritual or the ideal view. Um, of course, this is um, so spiritual, but it, it believes that the book of Revelation is just very um, ethereal and it applies to every single day of our lives. I've heard descriptions of this view, particularly from one liberal Anglican vicar who seemed to hold to this view because he didn't really have a good answer. Um, his actual answer was, well, let's just try and make the book of Revelation happen every day. At which point I thought this man clearly hasn't read the book of Revelation. Um, and of course, this is all in spite of the fact that the book of Revelation says that it is a prophecy. They just choose to ignore that bit for convenience sake, I suppose. So of the three sensible interpretations of the Revelation, two of these have been developed by the Jesuits. They are corrupt fruit from a corrupt tree. And why were they developed? For the purpose of disguising the papacy from being identified as the Antichrist. The motivation behind them is not inspired by God's Holy Spirit, whichever way you examine the facts. This all sounds very familiar now. How could this possibly succeed, you might ask? Arminianism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits, and that's well taken over, you could say. Futurism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits. Taken over, you could very well argue. The Puritan Thomas Brightman expressed uh, much the same around the year 1600. He writes, 
But mine anger and indignation burst out against the Jesuits, for when I had by chance light upon Ribera, who made a commentary on this same holy revelation, Is it even so? said I. Do the papists take heart again? So as that book which of a long time before they would scarce suffer any man to touch, they, doubt they dare now take in hand to entreat fully upon? Now they dare be bold and dare to proclaim to the world that any other thing rather is pointed at in that than their Pope of Rome? It was so obvious, and in truth it still is, that the papacy is the Antichrist, that it shocked Brightman to think that the Jesuits actually thought they could get away with just kicking up a smokescreen and hoping people would just forget about the papacy. And yet this is exactly what has happened. Most of Christianity today holds to Arminianism, sent out by the Jesuits to destroy the belief in the doctrines of grace, as so many Christians hold to the futurist interpretation of Revelation that was sent out by the Jesuits to misdirect attention from the Pope. But what of the fruits? Well, let's examine them. Arminianism was popularized by John Wesley, who founded Methodism in the 1700s, and he also despised the doctrines of grace, of doctrines of grace, a bit like Erasmus in that sense, I suppose. Yet he is frequently held up as a hero. John Wesley taught baptismal regeneration. Just read page 15 of the works of the Reverend John Wesley. And he also taught perfectionism and a whole host of other heresies. Uh, please see the link in the description box for a, um, a sufficient list of the heresies he taught and expounding on them. But worst of all is the placing of one's salvation in the hands of the sinner. I'll just quote him now. This decree whereby whom God did foreknow, he did predestinate, was indeed from everlasting. This, whereby all who suffer, uh, sorry, whereby all who suffer Christ to make them alive are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. I'll just repeat that. This, whereby all who suffer Christ to make them elect, sorry, to make them alive, are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. That's also in the works of the Reverend John Wesley. But you see, what, that's not what the scriptures say. It's not, oh, I'll go on then, I'll suffer Jesus to make me alive. We are dead in our sin. The scriptures tell us that we have absolutely no interest in God whatsoever. We're his absolute enemy. It's not like just picking a different flavour of ice cream. Oh, go on then, I'll just choose Jesus. The Lord says that he chooses us, not the other way around. I'd just like to quote some scriptures for you now. In Romans 3.11, it says that there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. No one. You see, because faith is a gift from God, according to Ephesians, Ephesians 2.8. It can be no other way. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we are told just a few verses before that we can only have understanding by the moving of God's Holy Spirit. We can only receive that by believing. According to the scriptures, it can be no other way but that God saves us. Truly it is Almighty God that saves whom he wills, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, in John 6.44, no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John Wesley and his Arminian tree of Methodism only served to further the cause outlined by the Jesuits, as I presented. Following on from Arminianism, we then see Futurism, and particularly Dispensational, and made popular by John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren in the 1800s. Also, Edward Irving, the acknowledged forerunner of both the Pentecostal and the Charismatic movements, accepted that the, the one-man antichrist idea of Bellarmine and Ribera, yet he went a step further. Somewhere around 1830, Edwin, Edward Irving began to teach the, the unique idea of a two-phase return of Christ. The first phase being a secret rapture prior to the rise of the antichrist. 
Uh, sorry, uh, for more information on that, just please um, follow the link on screen or in the description box. I really do advise everyone to, to research these matters, please. I mean, this was all picked up by Schofield for his version of the Bible. Anyway, this is all a very brief synopsis of what happened throughout history uh, since the Reformation. But I assure you that when you actually examine the facts in more depth, you begin to see the very definite influence of Rome. I strongly recommend reading the article on Futurism, which I've also posted a link to. See, this is exactly what happens when you allow a little leaven in. And this is exactly why the Lord Jesus Christ warned us so explicitly. The 1800s also saw the rise of cults that now have so many people in the world deceived, such as Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. Many of them with doctrines that grip people so deeply, like, a lar like um, large thorns dug into their flesh, so that even if they do escape the cult, they're wounded and grieved with the pain for quite some time. May God help them. Yet even though they might recognize the Pope as the Antichrist, hold to the historicist view of the Revelation, and claim to seek out all truth, as the Seventh-day Adventists do, their foundation is the sand of staunch Arminianism. And without it, the false prophecy rightly collapses. The false doctrines of Arminianism and Futurism and the other unbiblical foolishness that follow, fed to the professing church by the devil, are the reason for the division and the abundance of false doctrines, so-called denominations and carnal Christianity that we see today. Now, I'm presenting this information to you as a call for discernment. I'm crying out to you, as men have done in times past, in the name of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you may examine the things that I've said by the Scriptures and in counsel with our Father. I pray that his rushing wind would blow away the chaff and all of the fog that has blinded Jesus Christ's sheep, and that a fire would burn in our hearts for the truth, that we may worship him in spirit and in truth. I used to be obsessed almost with these different conspiracy theories concerning the Illuminati, who's really controlling the world, what's really going on. But you know, the Bible has the answers. And the Bible tells us that the devil is the God, lowercase g, of this world. And he is trying to run the show. He is trying to conquer things. But within Christianity, we must understand that one day there's going to come a separation of the sheep and the goats. And that the devil is constantly trying to undermine Christianity. It's not outside of Christianity. It's within. He's trying to corrupt all that is good. All that is called good. And it's happening today. We mustn't be ignorant of it. To conclude, I'd like to read Michael Bunker's conclusion to an article entitled The Ultimate Conspiracy. Loyola's plan has come to fruition. The Jesuit doctrines of anti-grace have become the dominant teaching of the churches of the world. The woman that rides the beast, that mother of harlots, has seen her offspring grow up into maturity. The whore churches that dot every street corner have the stench of their mother. Those people who are not brain-addled and stupefied in the sugar-water harlot churches are busy decrying the evil of the coming New World Order, while in ignorance they embrace the very doctrines of Antichrist. It is the ultimate conspiracy, and if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. Do Catholics go to heaven? You better find out, because odds are you are one.
face the facts, join our hands, make a stand. Uh -huh. It's time to gather plans, get the shot, take the chance. Till there is no one left, stay correct to the death. They can't ever break a freedom, we will never let them. The corrupt politics is killing the system. Cynicism is it, and it's everything that you witness. They tell you what to think, make you believe that they're the realness. They feed us full of lies, and yet we always forgive them. Huh? It's all conspiracy, and if you feed an inner witch, you're the puppet. The government's pulling strings from above you. It's time for the introduction to truth, and let's start a movement. We've all been brainwashed, they believe that we all are stupid. We believe in what we see and whatever our ears are hearing. But if you look close, listen, gather your own opinion, you'll understand all the lies, lines, and what's between them. This world is not your oyster, this world is a fucking prison. Come on. happening in our nation. We all will stand up for the fear of assassination. So they strip us of everything. We stand there and just take it. We're scared to make a stand a false flag operation. Research Illuminati. Find out by 9-11. You see they line their pockets. Don't believe the lies they tell us. Find to seek the truth. Realize we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our livelihood. It's time for us to do when the conspiracy or not. They owe some explanations to the questions that we got. What are the skull and bones? What is flying beneath? All these secretive means got you lying between your teeth. What's with the Bilderberg? I'm burning your effigies. I'm praying to Lucifer. How sickness can you be? While all of the time praying you believing in the peace. Just to keep up appearances within Christianity. Come on. Yeah. 